use this time to help us grow. Uh, so let's actually, you know what, let's start with a word of prayer, if you'll uh, stand as you're able. Uh, Father, we come to you right now, and we thank you for this day that we get to come together, that we get to praise you, and we get to worship you, and just be grateful for all of the things that you do for us, Father, because you are so amazing. Uh, be with us as we go through this sermon, or through this service, and then with the sermon, let it speak to our hearts and our minds, and uh, just help us know you better. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. We are so glad that you're here this morning. And um, if you're visiting with us for the first time, uh, we would ask that if you get a chance in your bulletin, there's a QR code you can click on and fill out some information. We would love for you to do that. Uh, if you didn't notice, there are some donuts in the back. If you would like to grab a donut as we greet each other, uh, feel free to do that. And uh, But we're going to give you a few moments to say hi to each other. Um, as you came in today, you may have noticed, uh, like, outside was all cleaned up, and you came in, you noticed windows you could see through, and, uh, and just different things. Uh, we had a work day yesterday, and uh, the, we had about 30 to 35, somewhere in that range, 32 people here uh, working really hard and diligently uh, to get the place back up and, and looking um, the way it needs to be looking. So if you were one of those, thank you. If you're not one of those, we'll see you at the next one. And uh, we're just excited to be able to do things of that nature. So take a few minutes, share with each other, just love on each other and say hi, and we'll call you back here in just a moment. As you make your way back to your seat, we'll go ahead and have a seat. And we're going to uh, spend, a, spend a few minutes in, in prayer, allow God to prepare our hearts for what he wants to, to say and do this morning. If you would, go ahead and bow your heads. and I just want to invite you to, first and foremost, Think about three attributes of God this morning. Three characteristics. And just thank Him for who He is in those areas. And I want you to ask Him to show Himself in, in three new areas to you today. whether that be provider or protector, counselor, rock, refuge, friend. But I want you to think about the fact that God is. When he said, I am, he threw no, qual threw no qualifiers to that. He is whatever we need at that moment Father we are so thankful that you are that we don't have to search in other areas for the things that we need or that we hope for Father that you are the one who is everything and this morning as we continue through the Lenten season and we think about the sacrifice that was made for us and we look at the 
the need for us to sacrifice for you. Father, may we be attentive to, to the things that you place into our hearts and to our minds. The need to turn over even the simplest things. But this morning, as we continue to worship you, may we understand who you are. And may you be so real to us today that we, we experience you in a whole different way. Father, for those who are needing someone to, to comfort, that they would allow you to do so. For those that need a friend, that they would see you walking next to them, speaking to them, laughing with them, crying with them. We all need a Savior, and we understand that, that you are that. But Father, may we make you Lord. May we turn these things over to you in a manner that, that takes the grief, that takes the pressure, that takes all these things away that hold us back from doing the things that you want us to do. And as we continue to worship you through song, through your spoken word, I pray that our voices would be like a sweet fragrance to you. And that Terry's words would be from your heart and from your mouth. And that we would accept them and that we would apply them to our lives and that we would live them in a manner that is pleasing to you. Father, be glorified today in your name we pray. Amen. Thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song.
very breath, the source of life, the source of rest. Oh, I need you. For the wind that fills these fragile. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes 
Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, 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 come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. thank you for sending your son to us and for living as one of us so that you could understand us better and give us the salvation that we needed through your blood and through your son and through your love and we're just so thankful for that father because there's no way that we could ever be good if it wasn't for you and for everything that you do for us, Father. Just thank you so much because your arms wide open is something that we don't deserve and you give it to us anyway because your mercy and your grace is so much deeper than we can understand. Just thank you with Terry as he delivers this sermon, speak through him, and speak to our hearts so that we can learn more about you and your love and your son, in Jesus' name, amen. You all may be seated. Those of you who may have thought the words were changing a little slowly, that is not Morgan's fault. Morgan was right on. The computer is running slow this morning. My guess is not unlike some of you all, running just a bit slow this morning. I'm delighted that you're here with us this morning. Uh, if you grew up in church as a child, there's a pretty good chance that you probably learned a song 
about the central character in our text for this morning. Because everybody knows that Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. They also know that he climbed up into a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Furthermore, they know that as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. You can thank me later that I did not sing that song. Everybody knows that much about the story, but not everyone knows the full story. And so if you have your Bibles or your New Testaments with you this morning, I invite you to turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, as we continue uh, moving further away from Galilee, ever closer uh, to Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus, uh, Luke tells us that Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay him back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. My guess is this story really begins before Jesus even gets to Jericho. It may very well have been that someone on the road with Jesus uh, came up to him and said, uh, listen, by the way, there's somebody in Jericho that you probably need to know about. He's a tax collector named Zacchaeus. In fact, He's the chief tax collector for the whole region, and he's filthy rich. Oh, and by the way, one more thing, he's short. How short was he? Well, the Bible doesn't say, but in the same way that the Bible tells us that King Saul stood, quote, head and shoulders above every other man in Israel, it may well be that Zacchaeus stood head and shoulders beneath every other man in Jericho. Okay? Because when Jesus sees him sitting in the fork of the sycamore tree, he recognizes him immediately and he says, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today. Zacchaeus does. He hurries as fast as he can down the tree and he comes to stand before Jesus and you can almost see him breathing hard, brushing tree bark off of his clothes and looking up with this big embarrassed grin on his face. And Luke tells us that he was happy to welcome Jesus. But then the story takes an ugly turn crowd begins to grumble, saying he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. You may be wondering, why would the crowds look upon Zacchaeus and consider him to be a sinner? Well, tax collectors were considered sinners because they were Jews who collected taxes from fellow Jews for the Roman Empire. 
and they made their living by charging an extra amount. In fact, some of them made more than a living. They exacted the highest amount they possibly could and as a result became very well off. They were considered traders who became wealthy because they collaborated with the Roman authorities at the expense of their own people. When Luke tells us in verse 2 that Zacchaeus was wealthy or rich, Luke may very well have been hinting that Zacchaeus had charged his fellow Jews more than he should have. In short, they may have had every good reason to grumble. But it's the next part where we need to pay attention because everything hinges on how we interpret verse 8. We'll come back to that. Uh, let's just hold off on it for a moment and we'll come back to it. Uh, so the question is, what's the simple uh, truth of the story? Well, traditionally, it's always been that encountering Jesus can change your life. And we know that, don't we? And that's where I was originally going to go with our message for today. Uh, that's what this sermon was going to be about until I realized that encountering Jesus doesn't necessarily change your life. You don't believe me? Just go back one chapter in Luke's Gospel to chapter 18. Because there we find the a story of a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus asking him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells this rich young ruler to keep the commandments to which the ruler insists that he does and has all of his life. So Jesus asked him to do one more thing, to go and sell his possessions, give the money to the poor. And that's when the rich young ruler walks away from Jesus sad. The only known instance in Scripture where a person meets Jesus and walks away sad. But he walks away sad. Why? Because he couldn't bear to let go of his things. In other words, he didn't change. And Jesus said as that young man walked away from him that it's awfully hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven. But then Jesus meets Zacchaeus, a rich tax collector, a sinner. But by the end of the story, Jesus identifies Zacchaeus as who? A child of Abraham which begs the question, what exactly happened? Did Zacchaeus' encounter with Jesus change his life? Did he somehow repent right there on the spot and make a promise to give half of his money to the poor? Or was he already giving half his money to the poor? Listen, it makes a difference. It makes a huge difference in how we read this story, which takes us back to verse 8 of our text. I want us to go back for a few moments to verse 8, where everything hinges on how we interpret that verse, okay? How it's been translated. For example, some translators, such as the New American Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version, and the Living Bible, they view verse 8 as a future tense. That is to say, they translate it this way, I will give half my money to the poor, I will pay back four times as much. But there are also those translators, such as the New International Version or the New English Version, who view verse 8 in what they term as future present tense. 
In other words, their translation reads, Here and now I give half my money to the poor. I'm ready to repay him four times the amount. Now, commentator David Luce notes that that's the only example of future present tense in the entire New Testament is this one in Luke 19.8. Which leads him to suspect that some of the scholars are letting the traditional reading of this story affect their translation rather than letting the translation affect their reading. There are still other translators, such as the King James Version and the Message, that view verse 8 in the present tense, which would read, I give away half of my money to the poor, and I pay four times the damages. Now, you're all sitting out there with different translations of the Bible. Let me just ask you, how does your Bible present verse 8 of our text? Is it future tense? Is it present tense? The fact is that the Greek verbs in this text are present tense. The first verb is... Didomi is present active indicative form. It means I give. Not I will give, but I give. The second verb, apodinomy, is also present uh, active indicative form. And it means I give back. Literally in the Greek, what Zacchaeus is saying is, I currently am giving half my money to the poor, and I repay anyone I might have cheated four times as much. Whoa. There's a big difference in those versions. Because when it comes to interpreting the story, you need to ask yourself, was Zacchaeus... So moved by his encounter with Jesus that he made up his mind then and there to give half of his money to the poor? Or was, Jesus, was Zacchaeus already doing that? Therefore not completely understanding why anyone would call him a sinner. The fact of the matter is it's as clear as it can be. Unfortunately, there are some translators who want so much for this to be a conversion story in which Zacchaeus encounters Jesus and becomes a changed man that they have converted the verbs. They have changed them from present tense to future tense. And even the ones who haven't created a special hybrid category for the verbs in this verse. They call them future present, as if Zacchaeus was saying, from this moment on, I'll give half my money to the poor. Now, I know what you're thinking. Terry, we've been in the weeds here. And really, all I want to know is what's your point? Listen, as I hinted at earlier, some people, want so much for this to be a conversion story that they are willing to change the verbs to make them say what they want. But let me ask you, what if we didn't? I mean, what if we read this story just the way Luke wrote it? with the verbs in verse 8 being present tense. If we were to do that, then maybe, just maybe, Jesus may have already heard about Zacchaeus' legendary generosity. In fact, someone might have already told Jesus Listen, there's a person I want you to meet. His name is Zacchaeus. He's a tax collector. But he gives a lot of his money to the poor. 
And if he finds out that he somehow has cheated someone, he always pays them back. To which Jesus might have responded to that individual by saying, huh, I really need to meet this guy. So when he came to Jericho, he may have already been looking around for Zacchaeus. And even though Zacchaeus was hiding in a tree, peeking out through the branches, Jesus found him. He looked up into the tree and said, oh, there you are. Come down out of that tree. I've got to go to your house today. I've got to find out exactly what it is that makes you tick. And Zacchaeus scrambled down out of the tree, happy to do so. Happy that Jesus was coming to his house. Because while he was a wee little man, he might very well have been the biggest giver in town. And he may have also been the most ethical tax collector in all of Israel. But again, this is where the story takes an ugly turn because this is where the crowd starts grumbling and saying, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus pulls himself up to his full height and says to Jesus, now wait just a minute. Lord, I may be a tax collector, but I give half my money to the poor. And if it turns out I've cheated anyone, I pay them back four times as much. And now it's Jesus' turn to be stunned. Because you see, he's never heard anything like this. And my guess is he stood there for a few moments. And finally he said, today salvation has come to this house. For he too is a son of Abraham. And in that moment, he changes Zacchaeus' status. Some might even say he saves him. You see, the word save in Luke's gospel has multiple meanings. It can mean to help. It can mean to heal. It can mean to be made whole. You see, I believe that when Jesus put his arm around Zacchaeus, when he told the citizens of Jericho that Zacchaeus too was a son of Abraham, something that had been broken for a very long time was being made whole. So, maybe it's a conversion story after all. But maybe it's the ones who were in the crowd who ended up being converted. Can you imagine, because he was a tax collector, Zacchaeus being considered a sinner was not allowed in the synagogue. And yet after his encounter with Jesus in which Jesus addresses the crowd saying that this man too is a child of Abraham, is it possible that maybe they are able to see Zacchaeus not as the sinner he, they thought he was, but rather as the son of Abraham whom Jesus says he is? And maybe, just maybe, on the following Sabbath day, they would have been able to open the door of the synagogue to him. And not only open the door of the synagogue to him, but also welcome him. Jesus says at the end of our text today, this is why I came, to seek and to save the lost. If this is what it means, then it may very well be that Jesus came looking for all of those people who have been pushed out of the circle of God's love so that he can bring them back in again. 
In other words, you and I may need to begin thinking differently about words like lost and saved. Maybe the ones who are lost are not only those who never darkened the door of a church, but maybe it's also those who have somehow gotten pushed out of the church or shamed out of the church or shunned. And maybe those who are saved are not only those who come to know Christ for the first time, but those who come to know Him again through people who are willing to seek them and find them and bring them back. Listen, we have just gone through two years of a pandemic. Do you know anybody that needs to be sought out and brought back? I mean, could it be the woman who used to come to church here every Sunday, soak up every word that was said, who used to sing to the top of her lungs? Could it be that person that we need to reach out and seek and bring back? Or could it be a young person or an adult who grew up in the church, but who's afraid to come now? Afraid that if we really knew what he or she was, or if we really knew what he or she had done, we would shun them? Ask them to leave? Is it possible those are also the loss that Jesus is looking for? And here's the thing. If indeed Jesus is out there looking for them, if Jesus is indeed out there seeking them, and finding them, and bringing them back into the circle of God's love, then why aren't we? Why aren't we? See, it's not just about the people who've never darkened the door of a church. But it may be that our most formidable task is to seek and to find and to bring back those who for whatever reason are not here. Are not here. I'm reminded of the story uh, again in Luke's Gospel where Jesus talks about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep, and he's lost one of them. And what does he tell us that the shepherd does? He leaves the 99 to go and look for the one. How many people do you know that need to be sought out found, and brought back into the circle of God's love. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, followed a week later by Easter. If you have ever said, when's a good time to possibly seek out somebody that doesn't attend church and bring them? I can't think of a better time. And if they come, we need to make sure that we welcome them 
and that we greet them with the same kind of love that God has for them. A love that caused him to send his one and only son through whose death upon a cross has made possible the gift of everlasting life. Maybe, just maybe, we need to seek and to find and to help return those individuals into the circle of God's love. Father God, we come to you this morning. And we find ourselves indescribably grateful of your love for us. And Father, we know there are countless individuals outside the walls of this church who have yet to ever receive your son Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. Father, we also know that it becomes a part of our responsibility to seek them and to find them and to bring them. But Father, we also know that with a pandemic that we've lived through for the last two years, that there are those who are a part of your circle of love. They were a part of a community of faith who for whatever reason find themselves outside the walls of this church. Father, perhaps it becomes our responsibility to reach out, to seek them, to find them, and to bring them back into the circle of your love. Father, People leave churches for a variety of reasons. Forgive us of the times that the reason they've left is because we have ostracized them, we've shunned them, we've judged them. Father, help us to understand that at no point in anyone's life are they outside the circle of your love. Father, grant to us the courage, the strength, and the boldness to do the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we committed ourselves to when we made the decision to follow Him, to seek, to find, and to save those that are lost, whether they be Christian or whether they be one who is yet to ever believe and accept your son, Jesus Christ. Father, if there's anyone who needs to make that decision this morning, give them the courage to make that decision. Father, if there's someone that needs to unite with this fellowship, this community of faith, give them clarity. But Father, may each and every one of us examine our own hearts and our own spirits to see if we truly are following your son, Jesus Christ. And what we say, and what we think, and what we do. And Father, if not, I pray that you might forgive us and grant us the courage to live as Jesus would have us live. And it's in his name that I offer this prayer. Amen. Those of you who are present, I'm going to invite you to stand. To join with Jackson and Hannah as they lead us in a song of response. If there's a decision you need to make, you need to make public, I will be at the back. I would love to greet you, to talk with you, to pray with you as we stand and sing. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he 
should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss! The Father turns His face. Mar the chosen one, bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin. Upon his shoulder, ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. He was my sin. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know. paid my ransom. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. Paid my ransom, but this I know with all my.
as Terry shared, um, this coming Sunday is Palm Sunday. And uh, I just want to challenge you to think about, as you go through this week, just what might have been going through the mind of Christ as he knew what was approaching, as he was spending those last days in his ministry trying to figure out exactly what he was heading up to and, and knowing that. So it, I hope you're getting and, and reading through the, uh, the devotions that are being sent out through email. If you do not have, if you're not getting them and you would like, I've got some copies down in, in the office. Just let me know and I'll grab one and get it to you that will take you through to Easter. Um, one last thing that I just want to share. Next Saturday, um, we have the Easter egg hunt, the underwater Easter egg hunt that we work with the community center across the street. Uh, we provide games. We provide uh, the registration table and the checkout table. So it's a great opportunity for us as a church to be um, the pre in the presence of, of our community and to let them know that we care and that we love them and that we, we're here and we want to be a part of their lives. So there are sign-ups out in the parlor right in front of the TV that's uh, posting other information. Um, uh, I said one more thing. A week from this coming Thursday is, is uh, Monday Thursday, and we'll have our Holy Week service that night at 7 p.m., and uh, so just want to share that with you as well. So make sure you check your bulletin, things that are happening in the life of the church, and uh, let's go out, have a, an amazing week. And uh, don't forget to invite those people that God has placed on your heart to come back and be with us. You are dismissed.